energy and we're really excited. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks to the Storytellers Cottage for creating such a place where people can come and worship story. <laughs> really all over. Don't forget the Harry Potter <laughs> dining hall upstairs. This is magnificent. Well, solstice, and that's why we have the lanterns this way. Um, we're coming close to it. It's, it's a magic time of year when darkness is so thick and then somehow we move past it and even though it may not seem like it, we're moving back towards the light. And it's a time that has become to feel really um, almost holy in our lives because it is a time for introspection, a time to eat, a time to sleep and dream and, and think, meditate on darkness. Darkness, the kind that is full of possibility and nourishes us, but also dark that is full of everything we fear in ourselves and often project onto others, especially those who are different or seem different from us. I think this is something um, that people thought about for a long time. Carl Jung had the idea of the shadow, all those parts of ourselves we are uncomfortable with and don't want to look at. But the song we're gonna share with you now is, comes from the Hebrides off the coast of Scotland. It's um, a song that was first written in a book in the early 1900s, but that means it was around much longer. And it's called Dance to Your Shadow. And you will hear words that are called mouth music. They don't mean anything. They are a rhythm to dance with, to dance with your shadow. <laughs> Dance to your shadow when there's nothing better near you. Dance to your shadow when it's hard to be living. Dance to your shadow when it's hard to be living now. Dance to your shadow when there's nothing better
people have dreamed of immortality. What if it was possible? If you really could find immortality here on Earth, what if there was an object you could hold, or something you could drink or eat, and you would become immortal? And even more, what if there was something that would make you immortal, that you could give to others? and make them immortal too. In the ancient Norse mythology, Idun was the keeper of the apples of immortality. She kept them in a small box and no one knew how they had gotten there, even Idun did not know. But all she knew was each time she reached in the box and took out one of the apples, another one appeared in its place. But here's the thing. Idun was the only one who could give the apples of immortality. For their magic to work, they had to come from her hands. Some people said the box that they stayed in was ash, and that it had come from the sacred ash tree Idresel, a towering sacred oak whose roots from crown reached through nine realms all the realms in North cosmology. But we need only to know about three of them in our story now. The first was Utgard, and that was a land of death, fire, ice, evil, giants. Then there was Midgard, where the humans lived, and there was Asgard, where all the gods and goddesses lived. There was a bridge that crossed over from Asgard to Midgard. It was made of rainbows, and it was called Bifrost. And the gods and goddesses could travel back and forth any time they wanted. But the giants, oh, they could not touch that bridge. If they did, their feet might burn. Idun was the goddess of rejuvenation as well as the keeper of the apples of immortality. But really, I must tell you, it was not what you call a complete immortality. In all those nine realms, all the creatures knew that the coming of Ragnarok was inevitable. Ragnarok was the end time, the apocalypse, the time when Battles would be fought, and there would be slaughter and bloodshed, and all of life, perhaps all of life, destroyed. No one knew. But until Ragnarok came, Idun had those apples of immortality, and the gods and goddesses could have one, and they would never die of old age or illness as long as she had those apples. But they had to be eaten quite frequently. It wasn't like a one-time apple. <laughs> you had to keep coming to Idun to get another one. And that was fine with the gods and goddesses, for where she lived was so beautiful. It was called the Everlasting Garden. And in that garden, it was always springtime. All that was in that garden was light and life, nothing else. So streams played music and apples of, of every kind, not just the immortal ones. All sorts of flowers blossomed and animals of all kinds lived there in perfect harmony. Idun was married to Bragi, who was the god of poetry and music. And they say that's where we get the idea of bragging. <laughs> Makes sense? <laughs> but Idun didn't see him all that much, for she stayed in her garden. She seldom went out of it. And the gods and goddesses would come to her to get the apple. And that was fine, because it was so beautiful there, and Idun herself was so filled with a sense of calm and joy that to be in her presence was pure joy. <laughs> Now, one day, she was working in her garden, and she sensed more than saw a dark shape fly over top of the garden. And she looked up, and she could see far off, riding on the currents of wind, the shape of a large, dark bird. And then she saw something falling from the sky. 
And she's, when it fell, she looked and saw it was a black feather. She reached down to pick it up, but it disappeared. That's strange, she said, but went back to work. And then, I must tell you, the feather did not disappear. The feather transformed into a small, dark scorpion that quickly scuttled up the folds of Edun's robe, traveled swiftly across, and stung her just above her heart. Oh, it hurts. Edun had never felt pain before. She looked, but she could see nothing. And then she looked out at her garden, and something was different. The colors, they weren't quite as bright. The beauty was not quite as beautiful. She quickly got the box of apples and opened it, and to her relief, they were fine, glowing with vitality. But a thought crept into her mind. And the thought was, my apples, they're good, but they don't really guarantee immortality. Mm. If I could only find a stronger magic, maybe the apples really would become immortal, and, 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 and I could save all the gods and goddesses. And then that thought left, and another one came forward. What if I didn't have the apples? Would the gods and goddesses still love me? Well, she got back to work and pushed those thoughts aside. <clears throat> in another part, in Midgard, two gods were traveling at that very moment. One was Odin, king of all the gods, Odin All-Father, Odin Storm Crow, Odin of the One Eye, because he had sacrificed the other to have the the privilege of drinking from the well of, of wisdom. And he was traveling with his half-brother Loki. Loki, doer of good, doer of evil, Loki. Bringer of change, mostly chaos, mostly through treachery and trickery. But they were half-brothers, and they traveled together often. And as they traveled, Odin loved to go throughout all the realms because he wanted to know all he could know of everything. And when they had left that morning, they had gone to Edun's garden and eaten up the apples. And when they first came to Midgard, all oh, the fields were so green and lush. But now, as the sun was beginning to set, they were in a place so desolate, Odin feared that they had wandered into the land of the giants, perhaps. And they were hungry, and the wind was growing colder. I'm hungry, said Odin. Edun's apples are more medicine than food. Oh, that is true, brother, said Loki. I'm hungry, too. I'm so hungry I could eat a... And just then they came up over a hillside, and there before them was a small flock of wild oxen. The two looked at each other, and with a great grin, in no time at all, they had fallen on that oxen, slaughtered it, butchered it, and had built a small fire back in a grove of trees, and soon, the pit turning, there was the meat roasting and the flames leaping up. Odin could hardly wait. And then he noticed he did not smell any smells of cooking meat. And he got up and he walked over and he saw the meat was cold and raw. What is this? And he put more wood onto the fire and Loki stood there with his arms crossed watching. And it was true, that meat, the flames were plenty hot, but it was not touching that meat. And then they heard a low, cruel laugh. And they looked up, and there, on the twisted branch of a tree, sat an eagle, the most enormous eagle they had ever seen. He was humongous. <laughs> oh, I see your fire is not working. <laughs> well, I think I can help you with that. Yes, I, that is my magic that keeps it from burning. Would you like me to cook your meat? And Loki said, yes, yes I would. If I do, will you give me my portion? Whatever I want. 
Of course, they said. They were so hungry. And so the eagle flew down, and with his wings lifting and falling, he created a great wind that began to sweep around, and the flames danced up higher and higher, and soon that meat began to cook. They could smell the juices dripping into the fire. They could hear the popping of the fat and the smell of that meat. They were so hungry. See, it was cooked, and Loki stepped forward with a knife to slice off a piece, and in that moment, the eagle flew down, snatched both hindquarters and both shoulders of the ox, leaving only a tiny bit for the other two, and flew off. And Loki was so angry, he picked up a stick and he stuck it up into the belly of that eagle, and the stick stuck. But on the other end of the stick, Loki's hands stuck also, and the eagle lifted up and Loki found himself holding on as he looked below as the ground was growing farther and further away. And then the eagle began to sweep him about and began to fly, flailing him into rocks and cracking his knees into the sides of mountains. Mercy, said Loki, but the eagle just kept flying. And then he took Loki and tore him across a bed of thorns that were so long it ripped off Loki's boots and began to slice at his skin, and Loki cried out again, what do you want? Who are you? And the eagle peered down at him, but it was not the face of an eagle. It was the hideous, leering face of Thiazi, the king of all the giants. Ah, Loki, I've been waiting for you, you most clever of all the gods. I have a job for you, Loki. Yes, the job only you can do. I'm sure you can do it. What, said Loki, I'll do it. No, I don't think you've listened enough, said Thiazi, and he dragged Loki across a glacier, and Loki sat down, pushing out his feet, hoping his arms would come free, but the ice was so sharp, and it sliced off all the skin of his buttocks and legs, and he cried out, and once more, Thiazi rose up. Uh, uh, I'll do it, what do you want? Ah, I think you're ready to listen. <laughs> and the Aussie stopped crashing him into things. I want you to bring me Dune and all her golden apples. Oh, I can't. Oh, I see you still don't want to listen. And the Aussie swung him around and smirking his face into a tree. I'll do it, said Loki. Now that's more like it. The Aussie began to fly down, and on the way he told Loki where and when to bring Idun, and then he'd let him drop. And Loki lay there on the ground, broken and bleeding and bruised. Odin looked down at him. What happened to you? I made a bad connection. <laughs> well, said Odin, I think there was more to that ego. Oh. Yes it, it, yes, it was. It was the Ozzy. Well, I'm leaving, Loki. I must go and protect Osgard, but you take your time. I wish you well on your trip home. And Odin left. It took two days for the Ozzy, I mean, for Loki to make his way home to Osgard. But during that time, he came up with a plan. And the very next morning, he went down to Idun's garden and knocked at the gate. And when she opened it, there he stood, looking so battered and worn. Why, Loki, what has happened to you? Have you come for one of my apples? I think you need one. Oh, yes, I, I definitely need an, an apple, but I hope it works. Um, I, I hope it works as... Well, of course it'll work, Loki. My apples, my apples are always work. My apples are the most shining in all the kingdom. Hmm, perhaps. Hmm. I'm not sure they're as bright as the ones I passed on my way here. What apples did you pass? Oh, I was surprised I'd never noticed them before. They, they were on a tree, yes, and they look so shiny and beautiful. Well, surely they would not taste as good as mine, said he to me. I don't know. They smell delicious. In fact, I had the thought, perhaps these are really magic apples. Perhaps these apples could even keep us immortal past Ragnarok. 
and he could see his words were seeping into Idun's heart. Well, show me those apples, Loki. I want to see them. Okay, I'll take you. But, but really, what's the point? You're just going to come back to your garden and say your apples are still the best. Unless unless I brought my apples with me, and then we could look at them together and, and taste and decide and see what we think. A fine idea, said Loki. And Idun put on a cloak, and she walked out of that garden. And as soon as she stepped over the threshold, she felt a trembling beneath her feet. And she was sure she heard the moaning of trees in her garden. But just then, a dark shape flew over again, and she looked up and she said, Loki, what is that? A bird, you do. Now, are you afraid of a bird? <laughs> Come on, let me show you. Let me show you the apples. And he took off so fast, Idun could hardly keep up with him. Loki, let me get my breath. I'm, don't you eat your own apples? I do eat my own apples, but where are the apples you want to show me? Just up that little hill, he said. Won't take any time. And she looked, and where he pointed was no hill at all. It was a steep mountain. And she could see at the very top was a tree. But it looked like it was bare, except for a large, dark shape that sat up in the branches. Edun followed him up, and when they got to the top of the mountain, sure enough, the tree was bare, but there sat the most hideous, evil-looking eagle that she had ever seen. It is, it is enormous, Loki. What is that? It frightens me. And, and where are the apples? Oh, the apples? And in that moment, the Ozzy lifted his wings and flew down with a screech. He grabbed hold of Idun with the apples and flew off with her. Loki felt no shame. That was a really big eagle, he said. And he went back to Asgard. The Ozzy flew on and on and on until he came to his own kingdom. And it was a place where nothing grew. There was no bird song. It was not lit by moon or stars or sun. And the air was sulfurous and foul. It was a place of death. And the only light was flames, flames that burst up from cracks in the earth and spewed out of the tops of some of the jagged mountains. And the Ozzy flew on until he came to a cave in the side of a mountain. And there he dropped Idun down. And there she saw only a small <coughs> opening high up above her where some of that orange light flickered in and the smell of that air choked her. The Ozzy took off his eagle guise and became a giant. And he lit a lantern and sat it down for Idun, and he said, Idun, welcome to my kingdom. I want you to be my bride. You want the apples, Piazzi. <laughs> well, the apples would be nice. Yes, I would like that. I would love to watch my old enemies become old. I would love to see them all crippled and decrepit, forgetting their names, forgetting all their power. Well, I and my kind, we will eat and eat of the apples of immortality and grow stronger forever. Not forever, Theasi. Have you forgotten Ragnarok? When that comes, my apples will hold no power. And Theasi glared at her. Perhaps, but for now, we can enjoy the apples. I will not give you the apples, then I shall take them. And he strode over to where she clutched that small box of apples against her heart, and he grabbed it, and he lifted up the top, and he reached in his huge hand to pull out one of those apples, but the apples just began to shrink and shrink and shrink until they became tiny, hard knobs. and rolled around so quickly he could not take hold of a single one. Mm. <clears throat> With 
an angry shriek, he threw the box down and strode out. And Idun went down on her knees and she gathered the box. And she opened it and she put her hands on top of those tiny bits of apples and she felt them grow whole again. She lifted one out and she looked at it. It shone with such vitality. And in that moment, Idun felt that pain again in her heart. And she knew that without her, her garden would die. And she knew that everything she loved would die. And Idun sobbed and sobbed. In the weeks that followed, the Yazi kept coming back, trying to convince Idun. But she would not give in. She tried hard to hold on to that feeling of joy, but it was hard. The only good thing was when she held the apple in the darkness, she could see more clearly how beautiful its light was. Back in Asgard, changes were beginning to happen. At first little ones, and then more quickly. Thor woke up one morning ready to wield his thunder hammer and found he could not lift it. And Freya, goddess of fertility and beauty, she had not a single amorous feeling. And huge streaks of gray appeared in her hair and lines around her mouth and eyes like caverns they seemed. And Odin, his voice, his magnificent, powerful voice, became shaky, even whining. And this, at the same moment, it seemed, they all realized it had been weeks since anyone had eaten one of Idun's apples. It had been weeks since anyone had seen her, even Bragi. So Odin and Bragi went to Idun's garden, and there the gate was open and death had entered. The flowers had wilted, the vines had shriveled, the animals looked ill. Odin had his suspicions, but to make sure, he sent out his ravens. He, Odin had two ravens, thought and memory, Unan and Unan. And they each day would fly out over all the realms and come back and have so much knowledge to tell because Odin had gifted them with the ability to speak. That night when they came back and perched on his shoulder and he stroked their glossy blue black feathers, he listened as they told him and he learned how Idun had been lured away by Loki and captured by Thiazi. They went back and the gods and goddesses summoned Loki and on pain of death and torture, he agreed that he would go to the land of Thiazi and try and bring back Idun. But I must borrow Freya's hawk suit first, he said, because that was one of her most prized possessions. And whoever put it on became a great and powerful hawk. And, the, uh, and Loki put it on, and he flew off swiftly to the land of the giants, the land of fire and ice and death. He flew round and round the mountains, looking for some way to know where Idun might be. As luck would have it, on that day, and thank goodness for the small bits of luck that appear in these stories, that day, the Ozzy had gone out to fish way out in the icy ocean. And so Loki flew round and round, and then he saw a strange glow, and he, it was so different from anything else in that land, and he could see the small opening in the rock, and he made himself small enough to fly down, and there was he doing. He spoke to her in his hawk form. Idun, it's Loki. Loki, she said. It is your betrayal that brought me here. What do you want? I've come to make it right, Idun. But we must hurry. And Loki took his magic and he turned Idun into a small sparrow. And he turned the cask of apples into so tiny she could clutch it in her tiny claws. And then they both flew up through that opening with Idun following him. 
outside the wind had kicked up, icy wind, hot wind, it pushed against her, but she tried with all her strength to keep up with Loki as they flew back towards Asgard. Hurry, Idun, hurry, because Loki had seen with his magic that the Azi had returned, and he knew they were gone. And he had become an eagle again and was flying after them as quickly as he could with a fury like a storm and lightning and thunder. They flew and they flew. Now when he had left, Odin had had all the gods and goddesses to gather wood and build a fire there along the wall that protected Asgard. And they had taken sawdust and kindling and put it all along the top. And they had soaked it with oil and now they stood waiting with torches lit. And they could see coming through the darkness and the swirl of clouds, a hawk flying with swift wings and behind it a tiny bird, a tiny sparrow, and they knew it must be a dune. And then they saw a pestilent cloud of darkness coming after them. And there was the Ozzy, his wings whipping up storm, creating thunder just about on top of Idun. But in, in that very second, Loki flew over the wall and they lit the torch and the flames leapt up and Idun just barely made it over. But the Ozzy, it was his own momentum that brought his doom. He could not stop. And as he whipped at his wings, the flames caught hold of them and dragged him down to a fire. On the other side, Loki had taken off the hawk costume, and there was the tiny sparrow just lying there. Odin went over, and he touched it. And Idun rose up herself. And Bragi embraced her, and the gods and goddesses, they cried out with joy, and she opened the box, and she said, who wants an apple? She gave one to each of them, and in no time at all, once again, all the gods and goddesses of Asgard were young, beautiful, strong. I want to go back to my garden, said Idun. I know it is late, and there will be a celebration, but I must go now. And so Rocky went with her, and they made their way back to the garden, and there, he went on in to the garden as soon as they got there, but Idun stayed out for just a moment. She looked up at the sky. It was that moment where darkness and light are just the same. And she saw in that light before day slipped into night. There on the ground was this pile of bones where some animal had died outside her garden. But growing out of those bones was a small gold flower. How strange, thought Idun. I have lived most of my days in a place made only of light and life of my own making. And I was encaptured in a place of darkness and death that I did not like. But here, outside my garden, are both light, dark, death, life. One cannot be without the other. And she turned to walk into the garden, and in that moment, she knew that was much to be done. She knew she would do what she could do until she could not. She knew she would be in service to the apples of immortality. But even more, she knew, she would be in service to what truly was immortal, life and death, light and dark. She looked up at the sky. It was dark, and there were stars.
or figure out the music. I'm so, it's so much fun to work together. We never told that story before. I've always wanted to, and that's what the gift to be able to tell it here. And we work with Doug on it some, because for me these stories is finding what is it? What is it that makes this story important to share now? You know, and I'm not gonna, you're not going to believe this, but this afternoon I was working on the story and all of a sudden I saw something flash in the woods behind us and this huge hawk flew by. <laughs> it was huge. I've never seen one that big in the woods. I'm like, Loki? <laughs> Maybe it was my prayer. <laughs> yeah, I watched it. He just flew from tree to tree and then finally flew off. Well, we're just going to share couple songs with you before we call it the Light one candle in the darkness and there will be Oh, no. 
Oh, no, no. No? no. 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 Oh, come on. You can't do this. Oh, I guess. Okay, you choose. No. It's not going to be pretty. We need that with this immortality. <laughs> okay. So we're not, we're not going to send the lights on, but um, we're going we're gonna to do an old song that um, Teresa added a chorus to, and the chorus is all about audience participation. Audience participation. <laughs> and, uh, the Lord of Misrule. <laughs> and uh, in, the, in the time of Solstice celebrations, there was there was a lot of ability to play the fool, to do things you wouldn't normally do for the rest of the year, to be naughty, to be body. So we're not going to go that far, but we're going to hand out some instruments for you to uh, I think you have enough. I don't think we have enough. I'll let you guys just enjoy that. So we're going to teach you your chorus part. You're going to, yeah, yeah, play your songs, play your. Um, <laughs> Oh, you already have You may know this song. This is called Drive the Cold Winter, but we'd like to teach you the chorus that Teresa wrote, which it just seems like it needed. It's so magnificent. It's magnificent. <laughs> so, should we teach you that? Sure. All right, this is where you're going to play your instruments and sing along. Uh, Drive the cold winter, drive the cold winter, drive the cold winter away. Let the like, Lord, like the, like, Lord. The, like the Lord of Misrule, will all play the fool. And hence the instruments and. <laughs> I'll get parts of whatever you want. All right, you'll get it. Yeah. You guys are great. <laughs>
Thank you. 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 Thank you.